of the fruits. And we're down to the last three right now. If you would, turn with me in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5. We're going to look at the Scripture one more time. It'll be the last time we look at it in this particular series. And I pray, to God, I pray that it's not the last time we look at the fruit of the Spirit, though. Amen? You know, God gave me some unique revelation on this fruit of the Spirit. And one of the things that He gave me last Sunday was one of the most profound things that I had at, all, at any time. And when I came in here Sunday night, you know, it was, it was in me. You know, and God said, the fruit of the Spirit is me. So that is me. And when you show the fruit of the Spirit to other people, you're showing other people me. You know, that, that just astounded me to know that, you know, that that was what God was saying. And the fruit of the Spirit is God. The fruit of the Spirit is the Spirit of God. That how, is the, how is the Spirit of God, God expressed in this world? It's expressed through His fruit. That was, to me, was the most profound revelation that I've gotten out of the study of the fruit of the Spirit. In it. And I believe it would be the most profound thing we're going to get. But let's look at Galatians 5.22 again. And we're going to read it out of the King James and the NIV. In the NIV it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. But now in, in the King James it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such things there is no law. Well, the three that we're looking at at this particular point in time are faithfulness, according to the NIV, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And in the King James, we're looking at faith instead of faithfulness. The word faith is used. And meekness instead of gentleness is used. And temperance instead of self-control. It's a simple substitution on words here, but when we look it up in the Greek, we find that in the original Greek, what they meant in faith was actually faithfulness. Faithfulness is a measure of faith in which we are full. We're full. And it's a state in faithfulness is a state of being in which it's as a it what that represents is the per particular amount of faith and the state of faith that is expressed to us is a faithful state. Faithfulness. It's one thing just to have faith. It's one thing to believe that God is God. Jesus is the Lord. It's another thing to have faithfulness in the fruit of faith. The fruit of faith being full of faith and being able to share that faith. Faith and faithfulness in all of its derivatives appear in the Bible 443 times. And faith and faithfulness are derived from a Greek word called pistis. Faithfulness implies the capacity to store up and hold in reserve an element or measure of faith or the capacity to be full of faith. Having faith and a reserve supply on hand when others around you are running out. When the rest of the world is in a panic, can't believe, doesn't know, doesn't care, and is scared to death, you're standing there with faith. You're standing there as an example to others. Now, when we bear the fruit of faithfulness in showing God to other people, we're going to be an example. It's that simple. We're not going to duck and run when things get bad. We're not going to cry and, 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 and panic when things get tough. Christians, if we're going to be different, if we're going to be an example of a Christian, and we're going to show these fruits, then we're going to have to show this one, faithfulness. We've got to show that we can stand on God's Word when things are not good. We've got to show that we can stand on God's Word and be an example to other people when nobody else will. It's a positive attitude. Faith is a positive attitude. It believes what it cannot see. It accepts and expects and is reliable to the point of discounting reasonable evidence to the contrary and says, I'm going to believe God anyway. No matter what somebody else says or what somebody else does, I'm going to believe God anyway. That's putting God in front of everybody else and everything else. No matter what's happening around you, you're still saying God is alive. The blood of Jesus is the same today as it was yesterday and forever. You know, when we say, oh, the blood of Jesus, praise God, we need to believe that. We need to 
can believe it, that if it washes us white as snow, we need to believe that. You see, a lot of folks, they get the blood of Jesus and they apply it to certain parts of their life, and certain areas of their life are still stained. I want to tell you something. When God cleans a person up, He does a good job of it. He doesn't leave anything behind. Now, you've got a lot of folks out there that are still fishing. They're still fishing. They're still looking. They're still trying to find something on you. They're still trying to dig up your past. But God doesn't do that. And when it's God's people, if we're going to show God's fruit to other people, we're not going to be doing that to other people. When somebody comes to the Lord Jesus and says, I surrender. As Christians, we've got to respect that person. You see, a lot of Christians, they're still fishing out there. They're saying, well, that person, they did this and they did that and that was their past and that was who they were and that was what was going on with them and so forth and so on. And so, they just keep on digging it up. I like, I like a saying that I, a, a, a lady uh, uh, had one time I read. It said, when you get saved, God takes all of your sins, puts them out in the middle of the ocean, and puts a sign over them and says, no fishing. Now, if God is telling us to leave other people alone that are saved and born again and claim Jesus, then we better do the same thing. If we're sitting around trying to dig up dirt on people and dig up their past, God's going to come back on us with it eventually. Now, we may do some damage in the meantime, and it may look like we've got the upper hand, but what happens in the end? God is going to flip this thing upside down. And I'm going to tell you that when God flips it upside down, I'm going to be on the top. I'm going to be standing up on the top of that rock. I want to be standing right up there where I can look down and say, I stood. I love my brothers and sisters and I helped them and I, I encouraged them and I gave them hope. I didn't discourage them and I didn't try to pull them down and I didn't try to dig their past up so I could slap them back down and put them in. But you see, when people become a threat to someone, what do they do? They start digging when something's wrong and somebody's causing you, putting heat on you, you begin to sweat. Well, we got to find out what's wrong with that person. Something about them we can find if we look deep enough. I'm going to tell you something. If you dig deep enough, you can find something on everybody on the face of this earth. I don't care who it is. doesn't matter. And the more we dig up the dirt on other people, the dirtier we get. We end up looking dirtier than they did when it's all said and done. You know what I'm talking about. That's a fact. But see, people are not smart enough. They're ignorant. They're not educated. They think they're smart, but that intelligence turns out to be ignorance before all is said and done because what they've done is they uh, oh God, what have I done? I mean, one of these days, we've got to stop looking around holding our hands out like this saying, God, what have I done? We've got to be able to walk around and say, God, look what I've done. Look what the Lord has done. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We've got to believe God and respect God. And we've got to have that faith to stand. I'm going to tell you something. When you've got faith in somebody, you'll be surprised what they can do. But now when you don't have faith in them, they can't do anything. You shut them down. You shut them down. The fruit of faith or faithfulness is linked back to our salvation. It's so important. You can't live without this fruit. You can't go to heaven without it. I mean, it says we're saved by our faith through grace. You can't get by without this. The fruit of faith or faithfulness is linked back to our salvation. This is one of the fruits of the Spirit. The Bible says that without it, it's impossible to please God. You can't please Him. If you don't have this fruit, you can't please God. So it's very important we understand that this fruit of faith or faithfulness is something we've got to have. You can't afford to go a day without it. Yet many of us, we have our weekdays and we say, well, I'm just human. I'm going to tell you something. That old saying, I'm just human, is a cop-out after a while. Gets to the point, well, I'm just a human being. I'm just, I'm just frail. I'm fragile. I'll tell you something. Everybody's so frail and fragile, God's not going to get much done with a bunch of frail and fragile people. <laughs> Praise God. I can see they're enjoying this today. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You know, God is in the business of stirring things up, though. Amen? Look with me at Matthew 23. 
We're not going to be here long. You know that. So praise God. Look at Matthew 23. And we're looking at all different scriptures than we looked at last Sunday night. So this is a whole different sermon. It may be on the same subject, but it's a different sermon. Evidently, the one last Sunday night wasn't good enough, so God had to have the microphone cut off. I was just there. I got home. I said, I'm going to pull these tapes out now. I'm going to finish this series up. I said, nothing. <laughs> Tell me why it happened. I don't know. Matthew 23, 23. Jesus said, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You know, Jesus said that faithfulness is a trait that the Pharisees and hypocrites lacked. I'll tell you something, we can't afford to be without faithfulness says they did all the other things. They put their money into the church. They made all the worldly looking sacrifices. And they, they did all of these great things that the world recognized. Yet the true fruit of the Spirit they lacked. Justice, mercy, faithfulness. You see, Jesus said you did, that, that the other things they were doing was right. It was good. He said you should do that, but you need to do the other. You see, this is what separates the church goers from the non-church goers. This is what separates those people right there. You see, the hypocrites were doing They were going to church, yet they didn't have the heart of God. And of course, we know there's people out there that, that have the heart of God. They're not in church. But praise God. God, Jesus said, Jesus said to do both. You know, we were talking about that the other day. You know, what, 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 where does God command us to be doing Doing the things Jesus here directing his command. He's talking. He's saying, You did the right thing, uh, scribes, Pharisees. You went to church. You paid your money. You did your dues. So forth and so on. But you didn't have your heart right. You know. So the church is full of a bunch of those. And then we've got a bunch of people out there that need to be in church that's got a lot of the fruit. You see, the devil's in the business of keeping people separated. Turn with me to another scripture we're going to look at this morning Luke 18. Verse 7. Jesus, he's talking here again to them. He said, And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? I'll tell you what, that sounds like the times we're living in. It says, when Jesus says, when I come back, will, will there be faith in the earth anywhere? Will anybody still be faithful to me? Hallelujah. We know right now we've got a, we've got a church full of practicing hypocrites and we've got a, a church full of other people that are disillusioned about church so they're not in there because of the hypocrites. No, that doesn't work. God's in the business of cleaning up the hypocrites and getting the other people back into church. He's in the business of turning everything around. And He's going to do it. He's going to do it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. You know, through our faithfulness, we inspire other people. By our persistence and our insistence on the gospel, we cause other people to come to God. That's what the fruit is why it's so important. Because it's a part of our witness as well as our salvation. It's the way that we continue, that we perpetuate God in this world. It's by continuing to bear the fruit of faithfulness and being faithful in the things of God. You see, people, the heat gets, comes on. They, things get tough. All of a sudden there's division. There's a problem. Somebody doesn't like this. Somebody doesn't like that. Somebody's at odds with somebody over this. So next thing you know, people go this way. People go this way. And next thing you know, God's house is split apart. You see, and you tell me that's God. That's not God. That's the devil. Some people want to believe in illusion. They'll say, well, God's trying to get his house perfected. I'm going to tell you something. God would have perfected it a long time ago if we'd let him. You see, we get in the way. We start putting God out and we start letting the devil come in. The devil is alive and well in the church. And people don't realize that. They think, well, now I get up there in that church house, you know, and I'll be free from all demonic forces, and the devil can't hurt me up there. I'm okay. 
I know some of these guys, and they run into these missions and such, and they think, well, if I get off the street and I get in this mission, I'll be safe. Because the devil can't get me there. I'll tell you something. The devil will walk right into your church house and snatch away those things of God if you let him. You've got to be prayed up, and you've got to be aware. You've got to be educated. You've got to know what God is going to do and what the devil is capable of. Hallelujah. And the next fruit we're going to look at is gentleness or meekness. I like meekness out of the King James better because it more accurately denotes what the, what the original Greek and Hebrew was, was intending to say through the word. Gentleness or meekness implies a loving, humble, spiritual expression or attitude in dealing with others. This is your humility side. This is your humble side. This is the side of you that God can use. He can't use the other side of it. Notice I said the other side because everybody's got to. You've got that meek side and you've got that opposite. Everybody. Whether you're born again or whether you're not, you've still got a meek side and a, and, and a proud side. A side that doesn't recognize anything but you. Everybody. Now a lot of people won't walk around and say, well, I'm a Christian. I'm humble. Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you're going to be humble all the time. I'm a Christian and I'm not humble all the time. But I keep it on my mind. I try to keep it on my mind every day. I tell you, since I started studying these fruits of the Spirit, I've had them on my mind every day. I haven't walked a day without thinking about them. And I'm going to tell you, we've got to pray about it because, you know, if that is God, this is the Spirit of God, the fruit of the Spirit, and we need to zero in on this. It's one of the things in the Bible that we don't need to forget about and we need to continue to concentrate on always. Humility, humbleness, meekness. It's the part of you that God can use. God says He resists the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. I mean, it's that simple. Note that meekness is a fruit that earns an inheritance as well. All of these fruits of the Spirit God has shown me if you practice and you walk in these fruits of the Spirit, you're going to inherit something. An inheritance. You're not only going to inherit it after you leave this world, you're going to inherit it while you're here. You see, that's the promises of God. That's one thing that the believer has the advantage over the non-believer on is that he can not only have the good life after he leaves or as she leaves, but also while we're here. The educated believer. Now you've got the uneducated believer that doesn't enjoy things here on earth. They're in misery, pain. I mean, it's like that old agony, pain, and misery on me. I'm going to tell you something. We can take that old country attitude and throw it off now. Everything about the country ain't great. Some of it is and some of it's not. We need to be real about it. I mean, there's a lot of folks out there in them cities and them big cities. They've got something going for them or they wouldn't be there. But you see, if we stay out here so long and isolated, we won't never know that. Afraid. It's like that music we were playing this morning at the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir. But it's great. You see, that's the sound of New York City right there. In Alabama. Hallelujah. See, we can bring some of the city in here. Just like we can take some of the country with us when we go to the city. We can bring some of the city in here. You see... But, you know, it's expanding the way we think. You know, if our mind is limited, then what we do and believe is limited. We're not going to be able to do the things of God. We're not going to be able to show these spirits, these fruits of the Spirit. Spirits. Spirits of the Lord. <laughs> fruits of the Spirit. Hallelujah. Note that meekness is a fruit. Promises from God are attached to those that bear these nine fruits. Promises. God's Word tells us we will be rewarded if we love you know, it's a quick summation. If we love, we're going to be rewarded. It covers a multitude of sins. There are other. I'm going to tell you something. The scripture is full of the rewards of bearing these fruits. Full of it. We can spend the rest of our days going over this scripture right here and, and still continue to learn about God. We wouldn't even have to go into the other books of the Bible. Joy gives us strength. It's obvious. Peace. And bearing peace. Peacemakers are called the children of God. You get a title on you. 
patience. He said, I want to tell you something. People that are causing trouble and difficulty are not going to reap a reward for that. People that are causing division and pain and suffering are not going to reap a reward for that. They're going to suffer here and hereafter. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. Are you trying to bring people together? Or are you out trying to stir something up? Hallelujah. Praise God. I'll tell you something. As long as you got somebody to back up your position, if your position is wrong, you may continue in it. Beware of relationships that do not cause you to flourish or grow. Amen. If the relationship does not cause you to prosper and move forward, then it's not good. If the relationship is something you can't get away from, then you need to modify the relationship. Some of us, we have relationships with people we can't just walk away from. Them. We can't just run from them. Yet a lot of people do. But we can't, knowing our responsibilities. And if we're in a relationship and it's not helping us, we're not growing it, then we've got to modify that relationship. We've got to look at that relationship between us and them, no matter what relationship it is or who we are. You know, my wife and I, we have to look at our relationship all the time to be sure it's flourishing. Be sure I'm lifting her up, she's lifting me up, I'm causing her to go forward, she's causing me to go forward. If I'm doing something that keeps her down, or she's doing something that keeps me down, it's not good. And to, for us to be honest with one another, we have to realize and say, look, this is not good, this is not good, and we've got to get rid of this. That's what keeps your relationship growing and going. You know, that's what married couples have to do. To keep a healthy, healthy relationship and one that causes the other person to go forward. Because if we got a negative point of view and the other person has a negative point of view, we're going to keep ourselves in that negative. We reinforce the other. Well, I, I think that's bad. I agree with you, darling. So, you know, nobody goes ahead. We're going to stay there. Because somebody's going to say it's okay. Somebody's going to pat us on the back and say, it's all right. You can think that way. You can do that if you want to because you've got a reinforcement. Now, if it's not good, we need to just say, hey, it's not good. We need to get it right. Praise God. Look what we can do when we get it right. Hallelujah. Let's move on here. Patience is said to develop a crown or an eternal reward through our patient efforts. Kindness, generosity is returned to us in reaping and sowing. When you show this fruit right here in the world right now, you're going to get a reward. You reap what you sow, what you put out. If you put out money, you're going to get money. If you help other people that are in need, you're going to get help when you're in need. Hallelujah. Praise God for that one right now. <laughs> Goodness and being fair in our assessment and treatment of others will also return to us in sowing and reaping. Just and fair re reputation as well. Hallelujah. Now, I, I, will, I will go as far as to say this, and this is the truth. That I've heard uh, Adrian Rogers was, was preaching on this. My, Becky heard it. I didn't hear him. And some other people have been preaching on this lately about persecution. If you're not going through persecution right now, you're probably not saved. If somebody's not trying to dig up some dirt on you or mess with you or cause you some trouble right now, you're not really radically saved. You're not really doing something for God right now. Now, hallelujah. But see, we can't walk around saying, well, I'm just a victim of circumstances. That's what a lot of people do. I, I'll tell you, I saw them in the city all the time, in urban areas. They sit around and say, I'm a victim of this, a victim of that, I'm a victim of this. I've got to be saved. I'm persecuted so bad. I'll tell you something. Just because you're a victim and you've got a lot of trouble and problems going on, don't mean you're saved. Doesn't mean you're suffering for Jesus. You may be suffering because of the ways and the things you've done. There's two ways to suffer. You can suffer for the kingdom or you can suffer because of unrighteousness. Both. Some of us, we suffer for a little of both, I'm going to tell you. But you know, being, being real about it. Faithfulness rewards us daily and eternally. Gentleness or meekness, a humble, loving attitude inherits to us the things of God. The Word says that God gives us grace and lifts us up by our humility. The way God causes us to progress in this world is by our attitude. Attitude. Attitude means everything sometimes. Sometimes it means everything. I didn't say all the time, but sometimes. Hallelujah. He elevates us through that attitude. Meekness can be interpreted as a byproduct of gentleness and, and vice versa. That's why the two words are interchanged here. Not to be confusing because in the King James and the NIV, they are one and the same. In the Greek, meekness meant gentleness. 
They work together. If you have one of the fruits, you're most likely going to have the other. One manifests itself up as the other one is born. Meekness is not argumentative. Humble people don't argue. Proud people want their way. Humbleness and meekness accept other ideas, opinions, and don't seek to have their way. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. True meekness requires a sacrifice of pride. You know, there's a false humility. There's a false way of acting humble. You can act humble. You can pretend to be humble. But God knows the difference. And actually, it shows up in the fruit eventually. I mean, if you're truly being humble, and you're truly, I'm going to tell you, it's a hard thing to do. It's hard to be in a humble state and be meek as God shows us bearing the fruit. But it's something we have to get to in order God to be able to use us and to elevate us and to cause us to prosper. Spiritually. It's like I said last Sunday night, you've got people prospering out there all the time, money-wise. That doesn't mean they're prospering spiritually or that God is happy with what they're doing. Just because you see money in the bank or a nice car or a nice house out there doesn't mean that person has pleased the Lord. I mean, it doesn't take a brain surgeon to figure that one out. I made more money sometimes when I was walking further from God. But that doesn't mean that inwardly I was not happy. Inwardly I'm more fulfilled when I know God is on my side and I am doing what He says. True meekness or humility does not change as a relationship develops, but, and, and, but it doesn't hide the hurt. Hurt is being. People hide their hurts in order to look strong. Let me tell you something. Everybody gets hurt. Everybody. Everybody is, gets hurt. Why would Jesus say, I came here to heal? I mean, if, 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 you have, if you're alive and breathing, you've been hurt. And we need to be healed. That's what Jesus is all about. Healing. Healing the wounds. It's like a little kid comes running up and says, I, I hurt my bow up. Jesus said, I'll come kiss him. Somebody just destroyed my, 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 my feelings today, Lord. And the Lord says, I'll come kiss him. I'll come make it well. That's the Jesus we're talking about. He's not standing up there with a whip in his hand and a, and a, and a baseball bat in the other ground trying to knock your teeth out and slap you down every time you raise up. That's not Jesus. That's what the devil wants you to think Jesus is so you'll stay away from him. See, the devil's the big bully. He's the one out there with that baseball bat ready to knock your teeth out. And believe me, he'll do it. Hallelujah. Thank God for spiritual ministry. Thank you, Jesus. The last fruit we're going to look at, but we're going to look at, let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10 real quick. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 2 Corinthians 10. Verse 1. Now this is Paul, the apostle. He says, By the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I appeal to you. I, Paul, who am timid when face to face with you, but bold when away, I beg you that when I come, I may not have to be as bold as I expect to be towards some people who think that we live by the standards of this world. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make, it, to make it obedient to Christ. Paul says, by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. Now that's pretty obvious right there. The Bible is saying that Jesus showed meekness and gentleness. Fruit of the Spirit. Jesus says, I'm here representing God, the Father. And by the meekness and gentleness, I'm showing you God. I want to tell you, this is something that I, that, that I, we went to Georgia this week. And I remember back in the 70s, there's a little town here called Dahlonega. Dahlonega, I believe I'm saying it right. I know how to spell it, but maybe pronouncing it wrong. But it, I think it's called Dahlonega, Georgia. It's a little bitty town, probably a thousand people or 
or less. And there was an old man that had a store there back in the 70s. And long before that, it went back to the Second World War. He had a little general store. And I remember I had been born again and I had come to the Lord and I was going to be a preacher and all this good stuff. And then I went back, backslid into the world. This was like in the middle 70s. And I was still in the midst of all this backslid state. And I picked up the Arkansas Gazette. And I'm sitting there reading, or it might have been the Benton Courier. It was a little, it was a paper there, a local paper. Anyway, I was reading an article. I think it was the Benton Courier, a little small town paper. But this was on the AP. It was, it was circulated around the country. It was an article on this old guy. He was in his 70s. I'm sure he's deceased by now. This was over 20 years. He was about 80. I think he was 80 in his early 80s. And he ran this store in this small town. And he didn't keep a cash register. He kept a cigar box on his counter with all the money in it. And he had been robbed in that little store over 200 times. Pistol whipped three or four times. And they asked the man one time, they went there to interview him, they said, why don't you defend yourself? And he stood up and he said, because Jesus told me not to. Jesus told me not to. Jesus told me not to. And, you know, when I looked at that, I thought, now this is ridiculous. I said, we, we proclaim the right to bear arms. You know, when I've got my gun, somebody starts to come at me, take my money, you know, I'm going to pull my gun down. Defend myself. But I kept reading that. I, kept, I, I thought that that kept an impression on me, and I had forgotten that for almost 20 years until this last week. And we went over there. And, you know, what, what the old man was saying, I call him an old man, the old saint was saying, was... That Jesus had told him there is a time to defend myself and a time to stand back. And it just so happened that in those particular times in his situation where he was at. Now, he didn't say if somebody came to hurt my wife or my family that I wouldn't defend. He says, when they come at my person, only personally for my money, if they want my money bad enough, they can have it. I'll give it to them. You see, Jesus works through different people in different ways at different times. And this particular example right there was God. Now, a lot of my friends would argue with they say, no, 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 we've got to defend ourselves. But I'm going to tell you something, this particular example was God. What God is saying through that man was that there is a time to defend and a time to stand back. A time to allow someone to be cruel, unusually cruel, and, 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 and evil, and hurtful to you personally, no matter what it may be, physical or whatever, and turn the other cheek. What God says is, why would I put it in the Bible if it weren't so? Self-control. Temperance. It's a Greek word. I'll try to pronounce this. Ingra, ingra, uh, incratitis. Incratitis. Means self-control. It's in the Bible approximately 20 times in the NIV. It's similar to patience. Self-control eventually rewards us by walking into a state of holiness. You see, self-control implies a strength. If you don't have self-control, you don't have strength. If you can't control your impulses, urges, and desires, then you're going to go and do anything that everybody else is doing. You'll look out the window, and the next thing you'll see is something out there looks good. I'm going to go do it. Something you look, you look, you look on the TV. Something there, it looks good. I'm gonna go do it. You pick up a magazine. Something there says it looks good. I'm gonna go do it. That's the opposite of self control. Self control means you're gonna see all these things that look good, and the world is doing, and the world says this is okay. I got my stamp of approval on it. But what does God's word say? Now, as Christians, are we to look like the world? Self-control means we're going to be different. Self-control in itself says we're going to be different. But you see, you can practice self-control and leave the other fruits out and miss God. You know, just because we don't smoke, we don't drink, we don't do this, and we don't do this, and we don't do this, doesn't mean that we're practicing these. We can be like the hypocrites. They were doing the same thing. They weren't drinking, they weren't smoking, they weren't doing all those things. Those were the hypocrites, the scribes and the Pharisees that Jesus had so much trouble with. The religious people. They practiced self-control. They mastered self-control. They had the long, lengthy prayers and all these things that looked outwardly to appear to be God. 
Yet inwardly, they were dead. They had none. No fruit. The fruit was dead. Self-control. Hallelujah. Look at Proverbs 25, 28, and we're fixing to close. Proverbs 25, 28. It says, like a city whose walls are broken down is a man who lacks self-control. Like a city whose walls are broken down is a man or a woman who lacks self-control. It's dangerous to not practice your self-control. Control yourself. Because your defenses are gone. Self-control will defend you in times of trouble. When the world is pointing its finger at you and, and trying to pull you down and trying to cause you difficulty, that self-control that you have been in for a long time will bear you up. It's very important. You know, the world will say, well, you can just go on and do this and do that and you can still be saved. I'll tell you something, that's what the world is trying to teach people is to do this and do that and have, have your good time and you can still go to heaven. It don't work like that. God's not in the business of letting us just do anything we want to. That's the reason the law is there is to keep us out of trouble. It's to keep us from getting hurt. It's not to keep us confined. The world thinks that the law is confining. The world says we need freedom, 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 freedom. I'll tell you something. Freedom. The freedom that we got from Jesus is the freedom that, that, is, that the world doesn't understand. The world thinks if we can feel good, we can do it. Whatever we can do causes us to feel good and we can still go to heaven. It's just if we keep our heart right. God says do all these things. Keep your heart right above all, though, Jesus said. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. The world is out of control. God's people have got to be in self-control. If we want to be God's people and Christians and bearing that fruit, we've got to be in self-control. Don't work any other way. It does not work any other way. The devil wants you to exercise all your options. Options. Hallelujah. Meekness is not weakness. Don't confuse it. Faithfulness, you can't live without. If you don't have faithfulness, you can't go to heaven. Word says so. Self-control. You're going to be hurt every time you turn around. If you claim to be a Christian and you don't have self-control, you're in trouble. Because somebody will say, well, you do that, you do that, you do that, you do that, you do that. Your witness is gone. Without self-control, you don't have a witness. You've got to have self-control in order to have a witness. If you want to show Jesus to somebody else, you've got to have self-control. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Let's all pray right now. Lord, we just thank you for this day, this Independence Day, this, this day that we declared our freedom, Lord God. We want to declare our freedom over the enemy today. We want to declare our freedom over the devil and his ability to hold us down and to keep us from bearing fruit. We want to claim our freedom from the enemy.